For the longest time, I've been fascinated with these machines called Thran Beasts. The creator, a Dutch man named Theo Janssen, describes them as a new form of life. And when you see them, that makes a lot of sense. I have the utmost of respects for Teo and his work, and for many years I've been toying around with the idea of building a strong beast myself. And so, that's what I'm going to be doing in this video. It should be fun. The key piece all these creations share is Janssen's original leg design. It has an incredibly natural, fluid movement. This is where I'm going to start with my creation. After gathering information online, I drew up what I was thinking in CAD and ended up with something like this. Now, while this design seems feasible, I also have no idea if it'll actually work. To start off with, I'm going to build a prototype of a single leg to make sure the design I came up with is sound. I bought a bunch of aluminum bar to make each segment. I measure the first segment's length and cut it oversized with my hacksaw. I square up both sides using my milling machine. At this point, I followed the same process for all the rest of the parts required for the prototype. The bar I bought is half inch wide, but each part only needs to be about a quarter inch wide. The most obvious place to cut the linkage would be on the side, like this. However, the sides of the aluminum have a factory finished edge, and I'd like to avoid one edge looking finished and one edge looking ragged. So I'm going to cut the parts out of the middle of the piece. This will give me two non-factory edges I can clean up on my own. In order to position the part in the right place, I'm going to measure 3 eighths of an inch from each side of the part with my calipers, which should result in the middle section being 1 quarter inch. With the width marked, I'll cut off the excess. For the rest of the members, I decided to try a bit of a different technique. I used some parallels and a scrap of Delrin to make a shelf. I put the rest of the parts for this prototype on the shelf and assured that they were lined up. I then milled all the parts at once, producing parts that are exactly the same height. One downside is that some of the longer parts were unsupported, they bent slightly. To fix the bending, I did my best to bend the worst offenders back into shape on the vise. Next, I need to drill holes in the end of each piece. This requires reconfiguring the mill. Ahead of time, I made a Delrin jig that can hold each part in place while I work on it. I'll mount that into the vise. Because this is on my mill, I can spend the time to ensure that the drill bit drills perfectly in the right place by adjusting the position of the bed. I found I didn't really need a center drill. Once all the parts have been drilled, I assembled them into a finished linkage. And here's the prototype. I learned a lot making this prototype, but in order to make a full strong beast, I'm going to need to make 8 of these linkages. This is going to require a slightly different approach, and at that volume, I'm going to need to revisit some of my processes to optimize for scale. 
The biggest change I'm going to be making when mass producing these leg linkages is to make all of each type of member at once, instead of making all the members for one linkage. Doing it this way lets me ensure each type of member is exactly the same. I marked all the first type of members in one go, and then cut them all with my hacksaw. As a unit, I squared up all of each type of member on the mill. I trimmed all the aluminum pieces to width. Here are all the members needed to make all the linkages I need. Next, I'll drill holes in the end of each member. I'm clamping these members against a metal pin so that they will sit perfectly flat against the back of my milling vise. Before drilling the other hole in the other end, I line up all the holes I just drilled by putting the pin through them. This ensures that as I drill a second set of holes, the linkage members don't move in the vise. And here are all the finished, mass-produced linkage members. I didn't get every hole quite right, unfortunately. It turns out that when drilling the first set of holes for some members, I wasn't able to line up all the ends due to burrs I didn't remove from a previous milling operation. That meant that some of the linkage members were not lined up, which caused their holes to be off. Luckily though, because I used the pin trick, the holes are the right distance apart, just offset slightly on the piece. Now I will put together the linkages. I made a little jig to help me out. I'm not tightening these bolts all the way, so that I can dry fit each joint and ensure the linkage fits together first. I apply Loctite to all the bolts. Hopefully between that and the nylock nuts, they won't come undone. Here's the finished linkage. I also made one for the other side, too. Now that the linkages are made, I will start to make the frame that the linkages will sit in. This starts by fabricating a number of T-shaped plates, which will hold all the linkages and the drive shaft in place. In order to hold the frame together, I decided to tap the ends of the pins.
plates that are between two linkages are special. They need to transmit power from one linkage to the next. There's one remaining linkage member, and each of these are glued to a connecting shaft to transmit this power. Off camera, I attach a second set of linkages to the frame. Here they are in motion. They move pretty smoothly. At this point, I started to run into some trouble. Originally, my plan was to install a motor on each side so that the machine could be powered, driven back and forth, and turned. However, I ran into a lot of trouble finding a good way to do this. I bought a bunch of motors ahead of time. I tried ones with gearboxes on them. I tried hobby motors. I tried building my own gear train. But in each case, the amount of torque required to drive the linkages was either more than the motor could drive, and it would stall. The gears would flex, no longer engage, and sometimes break. Or both. The thing that was so maddening about this is that there isn't particularly a lot of friction on the linkages. I can easily drive them by hand, and the motion is pretty smooth. I even tried to lubricate them a bit with some graphite, which didn't make much of a difference. I probably burned two or three days trying to get this to work, but in the end I decided the best course of action was to, for now, make this model unpowered. I did leave the gears attached though, and someday I'd like to add power to this model. If you have a clever idea for how to do this, let me know. I added some spacers to make up the midsection of the beast, that measured its length. This is half of the final width of the beast. So I doubled the measurements and cut the pins to their final length. I assembled the rest of the linkages, forming a mirror image to the existing structure. After this, the machine stands up on its own and is starting to look like a strong beast. The beast looks great on its own, but a display to hold it would really make it look that much better. I used a piece of maple I had that had some exposed hardwood. I think when finished this will really pop. I made the brackets to hold the beast in the display out of heavy gauge wire, bent in the vise. And here's a strong beast in the finished base. Even after all this work, the motor issue is still bugging me. I really wanted to see that strong beast like moving. But after pondering on it for a bit, I had an idea. As I'm making this, it's a few days before Christmas. And as always, I forgot to buy gifts for people. So, what if I made a sort of display for one's Thrawn Beast linkage that spins and causes the linkage to move? I think it's the sort of thing that people would get a kick out of, and I do have a bunch of these linkage parts left. I decided to give it a try.
I debated on it for a while, but decided that a servo motor would be the best thing to power each display. They are small, cheap, and most importantly have a gearbox on them that makes them spin relatively slowly. The problem is, they don't rotate continuously. Let's modify them to do that. I'm going to power the motor directly and bypass all the servo circuitry. Fair warning, I'm not all that great at soldering, and hopefully I can put some more time and money into my electronics gear soon. And here's the finished motor. Yep, that was the sort of motion I was looking for. That looks great! I ended up making a bunch of these displays, and I'm going to be giving them out to a bunch of my friends. If you know me personally and are into building things, stay tuned for yours! In addition, I made three extra that I'm going to give away to anyone who is interested. If you'd like to enter, follow the instructions in the description. I hope the people who receive these like them. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed that and thanks for sticking with me until the end. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in 2020!